So the fact that fish were, maybe bull trouts were, were in these pucks, what, from your perspective, what does that mean for Alberta moving forward when it comes to the conservation and maybe even the growth of uh, species at risk like bull trout and other uh, native trout populations? Sure. Um, so recovery stocking can be a really useful technique for bull trout, particularly reintroducing them into watersheds after we've dealt with the, the issues that made us lose them in the first place. And it can also be used for range expansion too. So putting bull trout into historically fishless cold water habitat that we think might be suitable into a warming future. And that was a question I put to Tara is, okay, you may have nailed the how, but the where? Um, seems to me to be a big, a big question. Hmm. And actually there's quite a few things left even in the how that we need to resolve. Uh, right now in Alberta and in other jurisdictions, there's very inconsistent results when it comes to bull trout recovery stocking. And typically folks have moved adult or immature bull trout around. And we think that might be one of the challenges. So bull trout have high fidelity to their spawning sites. That means they return year after year. And that's really beneficial because they know where to find mates and they also know where the best spawning habitat is to give their eggs the best chance. Trout learn where that habitat is because they were born there. So at very early developmental stages, trout pick up on those olfactory cues that help them identify that good habitat. So by moving fin fish around, you're not giving them that chance to learn where that good habitat is. But by burying bull trout eggs, we're giving those baby bull trout a chance to know where that good spawning habitat is so they can come back later when they're mature and spawn themselves. I know that one of the issues um, that you and, and others had to really pay attention to was the water level in terms of the depth that you planted uh, the eggs. Um, and you've, uh, I, as I understand it, have gone back uh, this spring to, to re assess mm -hmm. water levels. What what has that uh, told you so far? Yeah, so uh, Terra's research project will really help us understand the microhabitat characteristics that bull trout are looking for to give their eggs the best chance. And so some of those uh, environmental elements are things like water depth, water temperature, substrate size and competition, and groundwater. And having that understanding is really critical because in most places where we would use recovery stocking, there are no bull, bull trout there currently to show us where the good habitat is. Us humans are gonna to have to figure that out. So as a, a practical moving forward, what do you do with the information and, and enact on it in, in say the next couple of seasons? Right, so what uh, Tara's research will, will tell us are the range of environmental cues that we'll be looking for before we plant um, egg capsules. So let's say there is a, a good watershed, a good candidate watershed for recovery stocking. The first step will, will be a canvas of habitat in that watershed to identify those high quality potential spawning habitats. And then we would also need to identify an appropriate donor bull trout stock that can handle us removing some gametes from that population. Uh, and then we would plant the eggs and then again, a similar monitoring program to understand what the success rate is. But go a little bit further than this first research, uh, which was just looking at hatching success. We would actually look at hatching success, but then also uh, fry emergent success, success achieving juvenile and mature stages. The difference between, you know, maybe some people are looking at this and saying, well, why this approach versus we can just grow them in a hatchery and release them? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, these in situ recovery stocking techniques have some benefits over that traditional uh, hatchery approach. First off is that natal imprinting piece I discussed. So with fish species like bull trout that have this high fidelity to their spawning sites, they need to actually learn where those are in the wild. If they're raised in the hatchery and you put them into new habitat, they don't know where the good spawning habitat is. They don't know where they should go to meet, meet their mates. So I think that'll be key. And also anytime you bring fish into uh, an artificial system, they will go through selection. And we don't entirely know what that selection pressure might be. It might be in a hatchery uh, setting, really aggressive fish do better because there's no penalty to 
be the one that's chasing down those food pellets more than you know the peers that you're swimming around with. Whereas in nature, being aggressive comes with a cost. You're more likely to come across a predator, for example. And so there's there are these things that go on in the hatchery setting that we avoid by doing these entirely in situ techniques. In terms of pulling all of this together, Jessica, um, to, to say it was a team event <laughs> would be an understatement. You had a lot of partners at the table that mm -hmm. uh, brought in various expertise. Um, they've got to be excited about the results and and do each of them sort of peel off a section and, and look at, okay, what can we do to enhance the, the overall success of the program? For sure. This this project is an example of good science, good fisheries management, and great partnerships coming together for real results for Alberta's native trout. There's some excellent momentum right now in the province with various partner groups coming together. Everybody from conservation groups to industry, municipalities, anglers, and just regular people who are showing up to spend their weekends helping to improve habitat. And it's these kind of collabor collaborative efforts that we need to address these complex challenges that are facing native trout. And I guess when it comes to the eastern slopes, um, the real elephant in the room is preserving, conserving the habitat. I mean, that is just, what it, there's no point in even doing this if we're not able to, to protect that, that stream resource. That's right. And I, I think that's when it comes down to, you know, the understanding that recovery stocking is just a tool. And before we would use recovery stocking, we do need to address the key threats that impaired bull trout in the first place. And in some cases, that might be habitat impacts. And so in the future, when uh, we are thinking about recovery stocking, the first step might actually be to do habitat remediation and get that habitat fixed up before putting uh, bull trout eggs into that system. Is there any kind of a, of a stock taken of, okay, Alberta right now has X number of suitable streams ranging over X number of miles that we could grow or the potential to grow X number of bull trout. I know that's kind of way out there, but, mm -hmm. but are the, is that sort of the way something like this would be approached? Yeah, so we actually just completed a large east slope wide cumulative effects analysis and that analysis gives us the best idea of what threats are impacting each local population. And then we can start drilling in to what each population needs in terms of recovery actions. In some cases that might be non-native trout removal or addressing overfishing or fixing habitat or a combination of those things. And then of course, that's when we would be assessing if recovery stocking is also an appropriate option for that particular place. Talk a little bit, Jessica, about sort of the, the biology of, of these little baby bull trout, Alvins, I believe you call them. Um, what kind of stage of development do they go through from the moment they hatch in the egg to, to the time that we recognize them as bull trout? Yeah, so what we saw in the egg capsules was that stage of life called the Alvin stage. And so at this time in their life, bull trout aren't actively feeding. They actually survive off the nutrients provided by their yolk sac. And they live in the little interstitial places in the gravel. So they actually live underneath the gravel at this time of their life. And then after that yolk sac is, is absorbed and depending on temperature, they emerge from the gravel as fry. Now, so the pucks, uh, the way they're designed, do they, they allow these alvins to escape when, they, when they're able to, or do they physically all have to be dug up and, and, and released? Yeah, so for this stage in the research, the intention was to keep the alvins in so that we could count them and understand hatching success. But when we actually go to apply this technique in a real recovery scenario, of course, uh, they would be designed with a slightly larger mesh so that the alvins could escape. One of the things that kind of surprised me about, in particular, this stream that we were on was uh, the impact groundwater had on it and that that was such a, a critical component in establishing constant temperature, which is so important for these eggs to be able to survive the winter. So where are you at with, with understanding and, and developing that, uh, that knowledge? 
Yeah, so we suspect that the presence of groundwater will be a very important piece of the puzzle when understanding the best spawning habitat for bull trout. And what a lot of people don't realize is that underneath the river surface, there's this whole interplay of groundwater happening. So in some cases, water's coming up out of aquifers through the gravels and into the river, and those places are called groundwater upwellings. And then other spots, water is actually leaving the river and moving back down, and those are groundwater downwellings. And bull trout like groundwater upwellings because like you mentioned it keeps temperatures stable over the winter which is important for incubating eggs and biologists can go out and identify places of groundwater upwelling using a tool called a piezometer. I guess it's it's we don't want to overstate yes this is significant yes this is a, a potential um, tool that you have but it's not the tool it's not just oh we're just going to grow more fish where do, where do you go with it? That's right. So with recovery stocking, there's really a time and a place for recovery stocking. And we'll assess it as an option when we take a closer look at each localized threat happening in watershed that might be impacting the ability for that water to hold bull trout. So I guess in order to all of that to come through, it's almost a process of elimination. Okay, we've we've taken away all the threats to the bull trout population. We're dealing with maybe an isolated group of, of bull trout that can easily be captured and, and the eggs and all the rest of it collected. Um, the, the environmental conditions are right. So it there's a, a fairly lengthy uh, checklist that you have to go through before you would say, hey, this is the way forward and using this particular uh, method to bring back a, a bull trout population. Yes, absolutely. When we are thinking about candidate watersheds to do recovery stocking for bull trout or West Slope cutthroat trout or maybe even Athabasca rainbow trout one day, we have to evaluate the potential risks that are associated with taking gametes from donor stocks, genetic implications of the stock that we would produce. We have to think about the impacts on the current ecosystem, on the other uh, maybe amphibians and fish species and vertebrates that live there and also on the suitability of the recipient waters because we want to make sure that the waters that we're placing these animals in have sufficient overwintering and spawning habitats that they can be self-sustaining in the future. Because that's really the goal, is to create self-sustaining populations that don't need constant uh, supplementation through recovery stocking. And I guess the big unknown is, is, is climate change. I mean, we don't know what 5, 10, 15, 20 years could look like um, along the eastern slopes either and, and I, I guess you would maybe have to adjust the game plan based on again more cumulative information. That's right. Yeah, climate change um, right now the best thing that we can do is build resilient trout populations. So again a trying to address those key threats identified in our cumulative effects analysis and also consider those range expansion opportunities. So these are places that are historically fishless and they're cold right now and we think they might stay cold into the future. So we're increasing these at-risk species distribution that way and also providing them these thermal refugia in a, an uncertain uh, climate future. Well, we, uh, I think we're all sitting here with bated breath and hoping that all of this uh, can come through and uh, the future, uh, I would think for, for all of us, is looking pretty bright for bull trout. Jessica, thanks so much for your time today and for the, the great work that you put in and you and others uh, last fall and this spring going out in a snowstorm <laughs> nonetheless <laughs> and and collecting. I got to say, folks, too, that uh, Jessica was my camera person on that trip. I was unable to make it. So all that footage you're seeing is uh, an effort of Jessica and Tara uh, combining to put it together. So thanks so much for that. No problem. Thanks for having me.